Thank you for joining us at the 43rd Asian American International Film Festival. If you have questions for our directors, please put them in the chat and be sure to check out our screenplay reading right after this. Uh, so tonight we have for the parental guidance block, uh, the directors, Penny Chen, who is the director of Second Parent, Ha Lu Wang, director of The Pregnant Ground, Jennifer Ko, who's producer and lead actress in Mom Fight, Mickey Finnegan, who is the director of Mom Fight, and Tavari Crouch, director of Bitter Melons. I want to thank you all for coming to join us tonight. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. No problems. Uh, so I'm going to start off with the essential and most basic question. How did you decide to make your film? Uh, Penny, if you'd like to go first. Sure. Um, I think it went back to th 2017. I was taking a um, documentary class at USC. And at the end of that semester, every one of us has to make a five minute mini doc. So I told my girlfriend that why don't we interview lesbian couples with kids since I have I never know like I never knew like a real fam like queer family in my life. So that's how we started. So I found a Facebook group and I started to interview like about five couple lesbian couples with kids. And like it was I had a I had so much fun like hearing how they chose their donors and like that was how, because that's how, that was how like I picture myself doing in the future, but this uh, family, um, this particular particular family, uh, go on like went on and inspired me in a different level, or maybe like reminded me of something that I hadn't thought of, which is the uh, inspiration of this um, movie. So the way they created their fa their family really like fascinated me because um, so they. In order to be both genetic, genetically tied to the child, um, they decided to use the non-biological um, mother's brother as their um, sperm donor so that they can both be tied to the child. But um, so uh, I, think, I think it's a really cool idea because I've never thought of that either. But when we first uh, interviewed them, this kid, this kid was like around two, three years old. And like the second, the second parent said that um, she, she is like, uh, <laughs> no worries. So she's at this phase, like all she wanted was her mommy, which is her um, biological mom. And um, like she had, so the second parent had this insecurity and she was like, oh, she, was there something wrong with me? Or like, I, I see a lot of um, um, anxiety and self-doubt and insecurity in this loving and caring and fun parent. I think like this kid couldn't have asked for a better mama. <laughs> and so that's why I think like, why the, like this might be me in the future, maybe. So I was very, um, inspired by this story. That's how I, I told myself that, oh, I need to show this family because I've never known there would be this kind of family tension, um, even though that you are both genetic, uh, genetically tied to the child. So that's my inspiration for this movie. Yeah. Halu, what inspired your film? Um, so that, that I made it, uh, I guess almost two years ago, um, as part of my, uh, national film and television school graduation film. Um, so I, so, it, you know, the story is about a woman losing a baby, having a stillborn, having had an anxiety and kind of wishing that she never were pregnant. So it's kind of a taboo topic. And uh, I, I guess at the time I was really struggling with the concept of motherhood. And I thought it's something that as women, we should just automatically embrace, but I did not feel that it will come to me so naturally. And there were lots of fears and like different feelings, quite complex feelings that I feel no one talks about. So I kind of had this rebellious idea to make like my worst nightmare come true, which is I do get pregnant, but I but I somehow wish the baby's dead and then the baby does die and what happens then? Um, so then at the same time, I had um, 
like I was living, I mean, I'm still living uh, in this apartment block with lots of uh, roadworks happening. So lots of men are digging ground open all the time. So one day I was walking around uh, after dinner and I saw like a, like a bump on the road that just from nowhere, you know, it, with a shape like a pregnant bump. So somehow it became really symbolic that you have like all these men drilling like this, this, this bump and it felt really invasive and it was really loud. And at the same time, I had lots of family pressure because I'm married uh, to have children. And I just felt like I had no space for myself to really feel um, if I want uh, myself or not. So that kind of just came together as a metaphor uh, naturally for the pregnant ground. So I wrote it really quickly in a and made it actually in my own home um, around my apartment block. Yeah. Oh, cool. Jen and Mickey, uh, what inspired Mom Fight? I, I'm going to let Mickey go uh, first and then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, I'm I'm not a mom. I can't make that claim. But uh, I do have a sister who is a mother of three. So I'm an uncle many times over. And, um, you know, I just, I just always see like the you know, the, the sort of sacrifice and struggle and effort that she constantly has to go through to, you know, support her kids. And so, um, you know, for me, it was like, oh, you know, what can we do? Maybe maybe there's, you know, some, some thread that we can pull on with that and kind of do it in sort of a fun kind of superhero-ish way. As you can see, I'm like a fan of all that stuff. Um, so, so yeah, so from, from that kind of, you know, amalgamation of ideas, you know, out came mom fight. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just sort of a look at like, you know, um, the sacrifices that, that people make and, and, you know, if you frame them as such and, and, you know, maybe they're not, you know, maybe they're, maybe it's, you know, something that uh, people love to do, you know, so it's, it's just that kind of an exploration. Yeah. And I think, I think for me, Mickey and I, um, we wanted to make, you know, something just fun and it was, you know, for the holidays and, um, just do something that some people would enjoy. And for me as an actor, I wanted to do an action piece because who doesn't want to be a superhero <laughs> for a few minutes? So we wanted to, to put together and create a really fun, like story-driven action um, piece for, for people to watch. And um, yeah, that was kind of the inspiration for it. Cool. Tavari, uh, what brought Bitter Melons to you? Uh, first of all, I'm so sorry about that phone call earlier. Uh, this is real life. It's fine. <laughs> um, sorry, Penny. Uh, no worries. No worries. So what, what inspired Bitter Melons? Um, I wanted to feature uh, an Asian vegetable fruit uh, that isn't often um, featured. <laughs> um, and I thought it was a great metaphor. It's bitter. I was also at the time... Um, craving bitter melon soup. Um, I grew up hating bitter melon soup because it's like the name, disgustingly bitter. Um, uh, but I was going through chemotherapy for, for um, Hopkins lymphoma, um, which meant a lot of days, a lot of down days where I'm not feeling so great and all I wanted was like, comfort food. Uh, so I was, I was craving my, my mom's bitter melon soup. And um, in thinking about it, I figured, you know, I have a lot of downtime. I can do something with this downtime. I can write something. I can make something. Um, so you take the bitter melon soup. And I was also thinking about my own relationship to my dad and um wanted to play with those elements of food and father-daughter relationships and um yeah so eventually sat down draft something together and um there you have it bitter melons uh next question is for you penny so second parent started out from interviews for this documentary on lesbian couples mm -hmm. you were planning um and you focused on one family in particular. Are you still in touch with them? And yeah. if so, which you are, <laughs> have they seen the film and how have they received it? Yeah, so I believe they're watching right now. <laughs> yeah, we've become really good friends with uh, this couple and another couple who are their best friends uh, because their kids are best friends. They're so cute. They found each other 
at age one, like at the park. So that's how they met each other. And um, we actually shot this whole film, like in, well, not whole film, but the whole house scene in their house. They left, they vacated the whole, and um, they left the whole house to us for, for us to shoot for four days. <laughs> Yeah, and um, yeah, it's 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 a shame that we couldn't um, share. I couldn't share this film with them, like in the theater or like, because we talked about having a screening at their at their place for the whole crew, and then this whole thing happened, and yeah. So I only sent them the link, but yeah, they have watched it. They love it. I I believe they lo love it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good to hear because it's such a moving film and. It's nice that they were be able to be so vulnerable and truthful with you and that you could build your film around it. Yeah, it's it's so, I couldn't like describe the feeling that how much trust they gave me. And it it it's something that like kept me going. Like whenever I like doing the making, uh, doing the process of making this film, like there are a lot of obstacles and challenges, but whenever I thought of like, the support, the trust they gave me, I was like, hey, I got it. <laughs> yeah. Hello. One term all of the programmers have used with your film is immersive. Uh, could you talk about your approach to directing a film that happens as internally as it does in the outside world? And especially your the portrayal within the film of such an intense and specific grief. Like, how did you cast? How did you direct someone to just be and sit in such intense feelings? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. That is working. <laughs> that <emerges. laughs> um, I guess it's uh, for me. It's really uh, important to make people, uh, audience, feel. Feel it um, that it's a sensory experience. Um, so for me, I, I guess from writing, I'm always quite interested in an internal world of such conflicted women. Um, I'm very in, interested in what they're actually going through. Um, so I guess from writing itself, I wrote a lot of. I guess uh, it's quite subtle the the moment. Um, I want the film to be intimate, um, and I want the sound design to be quite specific. So I, I started working with sound designers, cinematographers quite early on. Um, and I know that casting will be hard because um, it's quite a demanding role um, for someone to stay in that state. Um, but, I mean, I was lucky to, to find the actress. She actually flew over from China just to do it. Um, and uh, I never met her before. Uh, we never rehearsed. We, she just read the script and she connected with it and she believed in the project. So she just flew over. And I guess it's a kind of a silent agreement between, I, I felt between women, like we didn't really talk about those feelings uh, in detail, but somehow mm -hmm. we just kind of understood it. Um, and it was quite easy to, and it was only after we shot it. And sometimes we became good friends and we discussed certain topics related to to the film, then I realized how similar we are at different approaches and to the similar issues. And uh, we never discussed it because I didn't want it to be analytical. Um, I just wanted to be, uh, I, I, and I kind of kept it open. I wanted to see what she would bring to it because uh, it's very important that she brings herself to this. And then it's afterwards I realized that um, lots of the feelings she has experienced herself um, and uh, and, but, you know, you never talk about these things. Mm. Um, and also some of the um, women audience that have seen a film um, that have liked it, it's much later that I discover um, the reasons why and, and what, the, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something that I, it's a kind of film, I guess it's immersive because I, I, I want to give a piece of experience and I want that to be free for interpretation for everyone. So, you know, in the end, everyone has their own, relationship with it um, because it's very subjective um, and that there's no one way to interpret it uh, because it's exactly because it's very personal and intimate. It feels like it's a 
losing a child in this way is a very taboo topic to discuss, but it's also unfortunately very common yeah, um, at the same time. Uh, yeah, when I shared a film with, uh, with festivals with different people, um, that's what I discover actually. I have people writing to me, uh, uh, yeah, about their experiences. And yeah, I guess I, I like uh, to explore such such topics because I feel like also women quite quite often suffer alone, and it's something that even in a couple, even you have a very supporting, loving partner, uh, you might go through it quite alone because it's such an internal experience in mm. the body. So I I yeah I I guess I really imagine that yeah. Um. So Jen and Mickey, um, Jen you happen to mention how everybody wants to be a superhero and i am not going to argue with you on that point i definitely think that's true super villain. <laughs> okay maybe i lean more to super villain <laughs> um, but uh, i was hoping you could talk a bit about the fight choreography uh not only was the action in the film super engaging but i loved these beats you had where a mom would pick up a toy and then consider it maybe as a present before using it as a moment to escalate the fight. Um, what was it like to direct those moments, Mickey, and also learn those physical movements, Jen? Go ahead, Jen. No, because those moments are all Mickey, so I'll, I'll let him, yeah, go first. All right, well, I guess, um, you know, for me, yeah, I love, like, the genre-type films and everything like that, but but I, I'll be the first to tell you that I think a lot of them, where a lot of the superhero movies fail, I feel like they are, you know, too much flash and not enough character. So it was really important for me to like make sure that while these two moms are fighting, yeah, it can all be fun and we can film it cool and have all the bells and whistles and stuff. But at the same time, to have like sort of the interpersonal moments and the the character beats to set it to you know showcase you know what they're going through and to give uh, you know the action the stakes that it needs. Um, so it really was just a matter of, of making sure that um, the, the, you know, Jennifer and Michaela, who was the other actress, were just, you know, always framing them to be in the moment and know that like, yes, you know, this is a Nerf gun that you're playing with. So how do we, how do we play with that? How do we react to that? Um, those types of things. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I think Mickey does a, he does a really amazing job in general, like infusing comedy and story into into stuff like this. And how did how did we want to make this without it just being like a long fight sequence, you know? So how do you make a story out of this whole thing? And as far as learning the fight choreography, it was so much fun. I think that was like one of the things when I when I saw other actors like working on action films, you're always like, oh my gosh, they look like they're having so much fun. And it really was like getting thrown into walls and <laughs> kicked around and stuff. It was such a blast and we had such a great stunt team um, just in making sure everybody was safe. And it was really just a dance, you know, it was like learning a dance. So yeah, I had a lot of fun. I know it's hard to learn how to throw a realistic looking punch, but also be able to take one that doesn't hurt yourself. It, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, half of, half of uh, the, you know, learning fight choreography, like that's just one part of it. And the second part of it is, is acting and selling, selling the hits and the, you know, the punches and the falls and the throws. So, so yeah, it was, it was one of the most challenging roles I've done, but it was the most fun I've, I've had on set to date. So. Huh. <laughs> cool. Tavri. Something I really enjoyed about your film, especially in the face of what we've been hearing about restaurants over the past few years, is that the, catch, the kitchen is really a secondary family for Sophia, uh, especially since she is cooking what's called the family meal and brings everyone together. And then that meal becomes uh, something that goes on and feeds the customers and sort of opens them up as a family. Could you talk about your decision to go that way and also how you found a cast that was able to portray this sort of familiarity. Um, if anyone who's worked in a restaurant knows that it, it is like a second family. Um, we're spending hours upon hours with the same people in a very intense environment, whether you're in the back of the house or the front of the house, that over time you build a sort of familiar um, 
setting and environment. And um, I have been in, in those environments. You know, I've, I've moonlighted, um, you know, there's not a ton of money in independent filmmaking when you're starting out. And um, as a film student, um, even, even when I was working full time, I would pick up a service job. Um, and it was a great opportunity to observe and, and be a part of um, those families. Um, and I had the, I really felt that being in those settings um, was a privilege to, to, to build those relationships and have those relationships. So I've, I've been a part of those relationships for can. So I wanted to, to borrow from those experiences. And um, I mean, it's, <laughs> every restaurant has its, its, its um, sort of these, these, you know, these outsiders, so to speak. Like they don't walk a straight path. Um, they're, they're a little rough, the food chefs, the people on the line, they're, they're a little rough. Um, but they're going to be real with you and they're going to be honest with you. And, and I wanted to pull from, from those characters. Um, and food in itself is how, how love and affection and emotions are um, presented. Uh, in life as as well as in the poem. Um, so it's sort of playing with different elements of, of, of family and food and how it exists in the restaurant business. I wanted to pay homage to, to the restaurant that I've, that I've worked with, to the people that, that I built relationships with, that I met um, as a young person, um, trying to figure out you know my way in the world. The restaurant in many ways taught me how to live and how to how to really save your life and how to really honor our relationships because there's a the family is loyal to our families to a certain extent, right? We're loyal to the people that we care about and that we love. And um, the same is the same is true in 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 a work environment, whether that's in a restaurant, in an office, um, wherever you are, but especially in an intense environment. Even a production set, you know, like it starts to build yeah. a family because we're spending, we're working on something so intensely. Um, you're all committed towards doing something really well, towards a single vision, towards a single goal. But by default, you're going to be tied together. Um, so, yeah, and there was, I mean, there's certainly tons of layers to explore in that respect. And um, I, even in the beginning of the film, as I was set out and making it, I wanted to remember the people that I had those relationships with. So, um, so I, I hope that that was experience. I hope that, yeah. <laughs> it was a good answer, and it was like a beautiful portrayal of those relationships. So you did the work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the next question is for everyone. Um, on a very basic level, all of your films are connected with each other because they're about parents or parenting. Um, however, another more subtle theme is the absence of a particular relationship or even a person. Um, in the case, or in the case of Mom Fight, the absence is the hot toy of the Christmas season. Could you discuss what it's like to direct around something that? isn't physically there. And uh, did this force you into making your visuals stronger to convey that feeling of absence? Penny, if you'd like to go first. Sure. Um, I wouldn't say it forced me to come up with something visual, but like from what I learned, it's always like in order to tell a better story, it's always um, a good idea to externalize the internal. So I think that's why I chose um, water as a very important visual element. And also the duck is a very important um, prop. 
So I think because when, when I was creating this character, I think as a second parent, this parent would do anything she can to please her daughter or like make her daughter like to gap the bridge to bridge the gap, you know, like, um, but what if there's something that she can't do? That's how I came up with the idea of what like aquaphobia and water. Um, because I think I think the water um, symbolizes the fear, the deepest fear and anxiety, and also it's something that she can't change right now. Just like the, the their, um, her genetic tied with her child, but at the end, I think she that there's no need for her to change anything. She just needs to be herself and love her daughter as she already does. And I think the duck. The duck represents the acceptance and inclusion. So at the end, and I think it's it's fun to play with this element because you know water and duck they can all tie together, and like that's a big part of my work. Oops, a big part of my work when I was um, writing the screenplay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Halu, if you could talk about the absence your... of a husband or. Yeah, I mean, uh, he literally gets pushed out of the window. <laughs> so he's in a way murdered, <laughs> and he disappears. Um, I guess the it's I guess it's also to deal with a metaphorical absence. So it's he's not really murdered, but it's really she kind of wants him disappear so that she has the emotional space to to grieve alone and to deal with this herself. Um, so I guess it's it's more the challenge for me is to connect the reality and uh, her emotional fantasy so that people don't take it literally, I guess. Um, so people don't go through the film thinking, where's the husband? Uh, <laughs> I don't see a body or something like that. So I guess it's um, it, it's it's through, um, I guess, introduction of certain magical um, elements from the start. Um, so that you feel the tone of it. It's quite in her world. It's quite subjective. So that you don't question her sanity. You know, what you don't look at her from outside her and thinking that, oh, she's a bit crazy or she's a bit, she's imagining things. But you really, if you uh, empathize with her, then you believe it. Um, so I guess that was the challenge. And also um, to build the suspense around that, um, I guess, to, to, to make him disappear. Um, the scene of the fight, um, which feels nightmarish, uh, that feels kind of, it starts like a real scene. So people don't know that it's going to be a dream uh, because I feel a lot of dream sequences, uh, people don't really invest in it because it's clear from the start that it's a dream. So people are just like, okay, people are dreaming, so they, they just don't care. But I think it's more interesting if uh, at the beginning it feels like a real um, ordinary scene between two people that increasingly gets a bit intense and uh, and it's the emotional intensity and the rawness of it that makes people feel that it's no longer uh, realistic because you will talk like that and you have then an element of the dead baby and then and then bam so that i guess that is the launch for the husband to disappear in a <laughs> in a kind of semi-fantastic way but rooted in a certain emotionality that's real uh, Tavri, yeah. if you could talk about the absence. Uh, in yours, it's it's the absence of a father relationship, and then also that's reflected in, uh, well, there's a secondary absent father relationship happening. How What's it like to direct around that? All right, Melissa, and I forgot, I did not answer the last question about class and how I thought. I'll just quickly mention that it's a combination of um, of real kitchen cooks and, and servers that actually work in the restaurant and a combination of, of, of um, real people that I have along with the professional actors. So, um, so now we're talking about the... the, the, the <laughs> it's okay. I, I made it extra difficult. I got to like... <laughs> this is who I am. Um, uh, so right, the two relationship, we sort of mirror, right, the, the mirror of her, the main character, Sophia, and her absent daughter, her 
a father that she's been estranged from, who essentially abandoned her. Um, and then the question is, how does she make peace with that? As well as meeting someone who is um, essentially, you know, the the MacGuffin or the the foil to um, her her own relationship with her father. Um, so it was sort of holding a mirror to her to say, you know, this, this there are you know there are nuances to why fathers leave their families, why people don't have responsibilities. Um, to their family again, going back to the family, right? Um, and I wanted her to to get an understanding of that, but also at the same time, conflict is interesting, right? Drama, yeah. and drama to push up against that and challenge the character in Carlos, um, who also is dealing with his own challenges um, that includes not being able to see his daughter, stay connected to his daughter, maintain communication with his daughter. So, um, and she's saying it's, it's simple. All you have to do is call her. Um, so there's the push and pull. And um, in that way, she becomes a much more active character in that sense. And in her telling Carlos what he needs to do, challenging him, she's actually challenging her own father. Um, as well. And in the end, um, she does make peace. It is somewhat of a happy ending. Um, but I also wanted to be very clear that, um, you know, that it's so complicated, that nothing, you can't buy, in real life, you can't buy things with a, with a pretty bow. Like, they're all residual emotions and, you know, it could go on, the film could go on, but um, I think it ends where it ends to kind of allow us to sit in, with, to sit with the the relief somewhat of of, uh, of an ending that sort of ties together, but also hopefully when the camera goes black, that sort of question for a few minute moments, like where does this go? Um, so I hope that answers your question, Melissa. <laughs> I make everything open-ended, so there is no correct answer. <laughs> and I realize this is a super difficult question for you, Jen and Mickey, because uh, like the absence is the absence of the toy. It drives the whole film. Uh, but also I noted there's kind of an absence of children within the store. Um, there's one child who shows up and her mom drags her off so she doesn't see the violence. Um, which kind of makes me think, if the children had been present, how would this story have worked out? Well, <laughs> well, there's definitely the absence of the dads who, we don't know this within context of the movie, but they're totally deadbeats. Like, they, <laughs> they, both dads were supposed to get this toy weeks ago, and of course they didn't, and they forgot, and so now it's, it's up to awesome. us. <laughs> you have to like show up and get it at the last minute, and that's why they waited. No. Um, but I think, if I can like maybe reframe your question a little bit Please and do. give it maybe some meaning without trying to make a fun action comedy sound more important than it is. Um, <laughs> I think, I think, um, you know, you talk about the absence of the kid and, and one of the things that I, I really, was really important to me to, to do this with the, the character arc of the uh, Jackie, as we call her the lead character, you know, at, at first she's, you know, she's asking herself like, why, why do I do this? Why do I put up with this? You know, all this crap, all the sacrifice. And then she's like, I gotta get this toy because my kid's gonna have a fit. So she's sort of pursuing everything out of fear. And that's kind of like this ominous, like child presence that she always feels. Um, but then like, you know, towards the end of it, going through everything, she, I think she realizes that like, this is, you know, it's something that she sort of wants to do. She loves being a mom. You know, this is like, it's not really anything she's sort of driven out of fear. She's driven out of like the desire to um, be this type of person. Um, and yeah, and so that's kind of like, I guess, where the absence sort of drives the story. Um, you know, I relate to myself of, of like, you know, sometimes we, you know, make short films and we say, we got to make a short film so I can get hired and be a director and do some, do some stuff. But, you know, it's always sort of important to remember that when it's hard and there's no money and you're on the grind and it's really, and it's really tough, like, 
this is something that you love to do. Like, you know, you love to do this. So that's kind of my, um, how I sort of took my own interpretation and meaning of the film with her as a mom and me as a filmmaker. I don't know if that answers the question at all. Uh, maybe I just maybe know I just too many moms, moms, but I never, I never really, really noticed, noticed the absence of a father. father. <laughs> <laughs> and like, um, and the, the whole idea of fighting with another mom for a toy, like just seemed very realistic to me. I don't know if anybody else has that in their family history where the, your mom has a, a, a story about this particular Christmas, Pokemon was super hot. And I tickle me out. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. It was like Cabbage Patch for me. My mom saw one, snatched it right off the shelf, and she would have brought out a knife for somebody else if they tried to get it. <laughs> well, so. people will, I mean, we've seen it with toilet paper, guys. I mean, we'll fight to the death for toilet paper in a, in a pandemic. But, but yeah, I mean, we, we see it at like Christmas time, Black Friday sales. It's a very typical human behavior <laughs> sometimes, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah. All right, next question is for you, Penny. Uh, can you talk about filming with a crew that consisted of a majority of people who identify as female, LGBTQ, and or people of color? Uh, where did you find everyone when so many other productions are like, it's so hard to find people who aren't cis, white, hetero men to work on a film? Um, first of all, I feel really safe and supported um, on set with this the whole team because I think every one of us has been at like each other's position before we know why we're making this film we know why this film is important to us and people out there because I didn't have a lot of budget so I actually didn't like most of my crew work for free for me and I think we I mean, I want to believe that we all want this movie to get, get made so bad because we know once it gets made, we're making some changes. And um, um, yeah, so we have, it's mostly like people of color. And also like we have, well, my makeup artist, he's a gay man. One of my actresses, she identifies as Sarah as lesbian. And the other one is... I, um, identify herself as um, asexual and also like my um, gaffer she's a trans woman and also a lesbian I think it's it's like we've basically covered everything like LGBTQIA and um, yeah it is and also my like because my and my sound person Kyle like he's a cis white like hetero man and he made this joke that he's my diversity hire and i just feel <laughs> it is so fun like we we're, we're like a family and i think i i talked about being safe on the set i think it should be more people like us in every set so that we can all feel safe and supported and not like you know anxious about oh if I'm making this right or wrong or like if I'm if they think I mean it's just so important to have this crew for me and I know this is something that I will keep doing in the future because throughout my career so far like I have constantly like been finding people like me like my people the people I know that we can support each other and it happens to be people of color and also um LGBTQ com community. I think these storytellers are important, very important to, to the whole industry and the whole world. Yeah. Hello. Uh, could you talk about weaving the special effects so seamlessly within your film? Um, I kept thinking about this ever-present liquidity uh, there's the opening with the pool, uh, there's the drinking of water, blood out of the faucets, diving into the hole in the ground, and everything moves while we're also sort of standing still. Um, so like this visual metaphor of just moving through things and flowing through things, 
feels like it's here, but it's not here and adds into the magical realism. And I would love to know a bit more about how you cut those things together, how people entered holes in the ground that were clearly wounds and so forth. I think you're muted right now. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> it's okay. um, it was a team effort. It's definitely not me uh, alone doing all the, it's really, it was really complicated because of the student film. Um, so it was quite ambitious on the script page uh, because she has to go through really seamlessly from reality to fantasy world. And that's how magical realism works. If any element feels really fake, then people will be taken out of it. Um, I guess we did lots of uh, we did lots of decisions in pre-production. Uh, we thought about whether we built the womb or we built a green screen only, um, and uh, we decided that we will build an actual physical womb and uh, with an integrated uh, 3D vagina on top, like which was <laughs> it, it was challenging. So we had a, a two. Uh, two team members who are specializing in compositing and uh, yeah and basically like they just literally built that uh, they built the vagina that has to move a little bit as well mm. it looks realistic <laughs> hard. so you know we really recognize it in real now you know it's not alien which is full of imagination anyway um, and I guess even the blood in the pool uh, we had to build a 3d model of the of the blood that spreads in the water because um, first of all, pools don't allow you to drop dye in there. And secondly, even if you do, it doesn't flow, it doesn't spread the way you want. Um, it actually is very messy. And so we uh, so we did to uh, we did do that. And for her to jump into the hole, it was quite hard because we didn't uh, because the hole is very small and it has to feel like free fall. So she has to disappear into the ground. Um, and no matter how tall it will be, it will never look like free fall. Um, so we did that. We did a green screen uh, outdoor. So we kind of uh, composite like two two shots together. Um, but for me, the the most important uh, overall philosophy of it all was to make it simple. Actually, to make it uh, as organic as possible, to do as much on set as possible. Um, and with, I guess, with sound and uh, with images, um, you don't need to do that much. You just do a very little bit, actually, so that um, it's very tactile, so people can feel it. So it's all things that we feel. It's because pregnancy, you know, it's about fluids uh, very much, and and uh, water and life, they're kind of, you know, so connected. So there's a drought in the whole building, and in the end, the water comes from a fossil. And uh, yeah, it, it, I feel like I want people to really feel the experience of, uh, of having life again in the end by having the, the drought finish um, and palms instead of blood. Um, yeah, so I hope you answered the question. <laughs> Jen, you were both producer and main actress in Mom Fight. Uh, could you talk about what it was like to have multiple roles for the film? And Mickey, uh, has your <laughs> has your working partnership been like this previously, or was this her first? Uh, so I have been a line producer for over seven years. I was in production actually before I finally made the leap into in front of the camera four years ago. So producing for me is. Uh, it's, I know it well, and I know, you know, and it obviously helps working with Mickey, who we're actually, we're married. So we've, we um, have our own personal projects, and then we also work together. Um, but yeah, pr having both roles, it's a little bit stressful sometimes. I haven't done that where I've had to produce and, and be an actor, because being an actor, you have to, I mean, just mentally and emotionally be super focused and not think about like, okay, how much time do we have left in this location, and that kind of thing. Um, but luckily I had, you know, I had a, a good support team of, of people trying to handle logistics and things like that while, while we were filming. Um, so it wasn't too bad, but I definitely preferred to do one thing or the other because <laughs> it's a lot to mentally juggle. Um, and then, yeah, go ahead, Mickey. Um, yeah, I, I, Jen and I have, uh, been able to work together quite a few times, I think. 
um, but not so much in this capacity where she was a producer and an actress as well. Um, but it was really great. Like I really enjoyed the experience and, um, you know, we, we were, um, we got, we had spent a lot of time obviously talking about, you know, everything. So I felt like she really understood like what I was going for and what I, you know, was hoping to accomplish. So, um, it's, I was lucky to be able to have that sort of like immersion from my lead actress in that sense. Um, sometimes it gets a little hard though, cause you want certain things, uh, and <laughs> You know, as a director, you feel like, oh, you know, producer, just make it happen. But then, like, as the wife to the husband, it's like, no, you know. So uh, th there's 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 that line that gets blurred a lot. Uh, you know, and and usually she gets to win a lot of those battles. But um, but yeah, I, I I love working with Jen. She's amazing. <laughs> if we were in the same room right now, I'd just be like nudging him. But <laughs> working with Mickey's so great, and it was just such a fun passion project and true collaboration that. We could do together. So cool. Tavery, I have a question about the opening scene in Bitter Melons. Um, we see a young version of the father gazing at the heart on the counter. And I'm about to get real film studies nerd with you. <laughs> so, excuse me. Bring it. Uh, is this? Is this moment uh, something that Sophia has been telling herself to deal with the emotional distance of her father? Because um, it feels like a visual representation of what we come to discover about their emotional distance. Uh, but if you're not paying attention to it, it's like a little slip in a longer, much longer story. Right. I hesitate to explain too much. <laughs> Scene, and I just haven't explained too much in general, but I end up explaining too much. Um, uh, yeah, so there's a level of um, dream world, magical realism, call it whatever you mm. want, um, sort of set the scene that we're actually in Sophia's dream. Um, or we're not. There is sort of an, an entering and exiting of that dream because the mother who is present in present day, she's, she's grounding us in present day. Um, and then, as you mentioned, Melissa, yes, there, this is the younger version. Now, a little reveal. I was, I had to use the younger version, the younger version, um, the younger version of the father and build him in because I had a hard time casting for the older version. So we shot the film in pieces. Um, so there was one set of filming the first time for the first half of the film, for the first six minutes. Um, and we did that because I knew it would be challenging to cast for the entire film at one time. So um, I set up the challenge for myself <laughs> to let's just break up the filming. We may lose some momentum, but let's let's kind of play with that. Um, so because we cannot cast the the older dad, we're like, okay. He's gonna be work. We know we have a younger version. Let's just work with that, um, and we'll just kind of build this into the dream world of how she sees her father, because that was the last last time that he connected with her father, that he was a part of her life. So she sees in her dream the younger version, not the older version. Um, so that's 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 a part of the memory of why there's a younger version to be why the choice was to do a younger version versus an older version. But in creating that dream world, it made it made sense because this is a dream that she's having that's coming from within, that is an internal experience that she's having in relation to her own memories of her father, who was as she remembers him, is this younger version. So um, 
So yeah, it's, 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 I, I mean, I did wonder, is this going to trip people up? You know, are they going to be confused? Um, and if they are, that's okay. <laughs> okay if they're confused. Now I feel bad that I spoiled it for myself because it was, it fits so seamlessly uh, into the film that I didn't even notice it the first time I watched it. I was just like, cool. All right. This makes sense. Oh, wait, when I watched it a second time, I didn't even, it felt, it felt like a part of this world. It felt like this is how we actually are and how we interact. And this is how we do memories. So right. it definitely right. worked. <laughs> uh, so we have a question from Brian Yang, uh, who would like to know what filmmakers do you all look up to? Uh, Penny, if you'd like to let us know. Is this Brian, the Brian Yang that in my film? <laughs> I believe this is the this is one of my actors, but I'm not sure because I couldn't see him. Hi, Brian, if you are there. Um, filmmakers that I looked up to. I so last year I watched a movie that officially became my favorite of all time, which is Portrait of a Lady on Fire. So Celine Shama has become one of my goddess right now. <laughs> yeah, I really admire her. Like and her films and her stories and how she made that story happen. She is incredible. Yeah. Halu, a favorite filmmaker that you look oh, up to? Um, of all time, maybe Ingmar Bergman. <laughs> but uh, I actually love uh, Celine's film from last year that I was gonna say that it's my favorite film from last year. And I met her a few times in London and I just love the way she, uh, she depicts uh, female subjectivity, female desire. It's the things that are not, that it's the things she chooses not to explain, um, just simply to show a woman, um, you know, in a period film having a smoke. I think that actually the simplicity of that is radical. Like we rarely see a woman just enjoying herself uh, at that period um, like that. And, uh, and how nudity doesn't feel um, exploitative exploitative but actually mm. just natural and organic i think it's the gaze of of her, of her that i really admire i guess i like Bergman because i like the intimate um scenes and the emotionality of it jen do you have a filmmaker you look up to honestly i think right now with all the the tv marathoning i mean ryan ryan murphy is like my hand so he's such a god i i just i love all of his shows and he just brings so much style and color and complex characters and he's just such a genius in his in his stories um and the actors that he brings on so i know it's kind of like a uh, of course but ryan, ryan murphy's he, i think he's phenomenal and i i definitely look up to him and it's all all of his accomplishments so there is no wrong answer, so don't worry. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> Mickey, if you could name a favorite filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have I have a lot, but but definitely one that, that comes to mind for sure is, is Taika Waititi for me. Um, I just like the, I just love like how he is always able to kind of tackle like really important topics, but always treat them, you know, with, um, you know, a sense of humor and also like with what, what I interpret as like a very, from a very loving place. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, his, the messaging in, in a lot of his films, it always really resonates with me because it's, it's, it's very hopeful. Um, and that's something that I really like and appreciate um, with all of his, with his work. Cool. Tavri, if you could let us know a filmmaker you look up to. Well, Penny, Penny and Halloween took my Celine Siama. <laughs> I, I loved her film, uh, Girlhood. Uh, it's just fantastic. Um, but let me name someone new. That we <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> well, I, I have such a love for Pedro Amaldivar for Spanish films. Um, I love his use of colors. Um, screwball comedy, even the classics, he's very much influenced by that, um, as well as melodrama. Give me melodrama any day, bitter melody is a melodrama. So, um, and use of colors, use of colors, just focus on women, um, 
you know, it's maybe it's, 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 you know, his, his gaze is also very specific, but it's a very like loving, loving gaze of the woman. Um, yeah. And he, he plays with magic They're you know, they're screwy. Some of his films are screwy and just, um, strange, like, um, uh, his earlier films, um, His earlier films were, you know, he he centers the mother, the mother, um, as well as daughters. Yeah, and I just I adore Pedro Amaldivar. I think we all do, and if we don't, <laughs> I just can't have a conversation with that person. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I'd love to know what everyone is doing next or what they've just been getting up to you since we're all mostly trapped in our homes right now. Uh, Penny, what are you working on? Um, it's really hard to say, like for now I'm just chilling. <laughs> no, um, I am, I'm going to like write my next short soon because I'm currently in Taiwan. I think it's probably one of the most like one of the safest place to make a film right now <laughs> yeah i want to like seize this opportunity to like make my next short maybe not as big as that one but a, a second parent but yeah and also like i adapted a second parent to a feature length screenplay so i'm going to rewrite it but it's it's been so long that i have been working on this project so i'm gonna give myself a break <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello, what have you been doing? I've been um, working on two features. Uh, one is uh, English sci-fi. It's an adaptation of a sci-fi short story. It's uh, kind of a love story, um, but really about a marriage breaking down. <laughs> and uh, in uh, yeah, and the other one is a Chinese language psychological suspense. So psychological fantasy, I guess, is very is my original uh, screenplay. Um, so that that is um, so the yeah one is finished the screenplay the other is still developing, uh, hoping to shoot in China next year when like when I can actually travel, and uh, the science fiction probably shoot somewhere in Europe. Yeah. Cool, Jen, what are you working? So I'm actually um, developing a feature. It's actually called Made in Taiwan. That's the working title. And Penny, I'd love to chat with you after this. Um, but it's a coming of age dramedy about a woman in her mid thirties who decides to have her eggs frozen in, in Taiwan, which is like a really big business there. And it's like a 75% of the cost as it is in the US. And it's, yeah, it's a coming of age dramedy about a woman who is trying to figure out whether or not she wants to be a mother, but she needs to buy herself more time. And, you know, she discovers her roots and, you know, whether or not she, she wants to move forward with motherhood at some point in her life. So that's what I'm working on right now. Cool. And Mickey. Um, yeah, I have uh, two features that I've written that I'm, you know, sort of actively trying to uh, get going. Uh, hopefully, maybe next, sometime next year when people can film in Los Angeles again. Um, but they're they're very much, uh, I would say, sort of in line with with kind of mom fight. There, one is a, an action comedy um, about an EMT who suspects that his neighbor is a supervillain. Um, but there's a, you know, it's a adventure, fun film uh, with some heart to it and kind of plays with that adage of, you know, not all heroes wear capes. So, yeah. Cool. And Tavari, what have you been up to? Um, writing multiple things. I, I'm... No pressure. But what I'm actively, <laughs> I'm actively um, developing is, is also a feature um, that uh, incorporates music. Oh. Um, a combination of Chicago jazz, Chicago blues. I want to center Chicago. So I feel like there's not enough Chicago featured um, in, in, uh, in films, um, as well as it's, it's a road movie. So we have uh, a young woman protagonist who discovers a lost record that was left uh, to her by her her dead father and, um, and, and listening to the record, she 
recognizes a voice, a very haunting voice, and it's that voice that directs her on the journey from um, sort of a re reversal of the Great Migration because um, it also involves her and her friends um, traveling from Chicago down to the south. So, and uh, you know, where that leads her, we'll find out. If, if, if the journey takes her to what she finds is actually what she needs. Um, yeah, that's, that's a work in progress. Well, I wanna thank our directors and our producer slash actress uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, I really appreciate it, especially those of you who are up in the middle of the night to answer questions. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to thank our audience for joining us today. And if you hang out for a little bit, you can check out our screenplay reading right after this.